Okay, God has given us a series of messages about his trumpets. And uh, at, at the end of each of these messages, he's also reminding us of how we can apply it in our own lives. And today we're looking especially at three trumpets uh, that uh, Israel has been associated with and that God gave to them. We're going to look at two kinds. Um, Mike has been gracious enough to, to bring um, a shofar with us uh, here today. And uh, part of our message is about the shofar. So, Mike, would you uh, say something about this, where you got it and kind of where it comes from, and then uh, maybe uh, go ahead and blow it, and let's uh, get everybody's attention in this building. <laughs> So this shofar is a Yemenite shofar. It's um, a different kind. It's different than a ram's horn. A ram's horn comes from a male sheep, a ram. Uh, of course, a male kudu that this horn comes from can be called a ram as well. But this is from a kudu. It's an animal called a kudu. As you can see, it's got um, Hebrew script here. My father-in-law brought it back from Israel for me. Cool. So um, when the seven angels mentioned in the book of Revelation are each given a horn, there's seven shofars, and this is a shofar. Mm -hmm. um, the shofar has a very distinctive sound, which I'll demonstrate for you now. <laughs> That's good. And I'll give it back to you, Pastor. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> now, imagine, imagine as they marched around Jericho and the walls were getting ready to come down. Wow. Imagine how many shofar would have been blown at the same time. Wow. You think... This was loud. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But this is um, uh, typically a uh, shofar, the horn of a ram. Um, and um, it, I made a couple points here under A in your notes because a lot of times we think about the horn, but we don't think about the fact that to, to get this horn, there was more than likely, the death of the sheep. Yeah. Okay? Uh, there had to be death. Now, even if you cut one off of a live sheep, and let's say you cut both of them off, that sheep is left defenseless. And from what I understand, they won't live very long like that. So either way, whether you harvested it off of a dead animal or whether you harvested it off of a live animal, that animal is going to give its life in order to have this shofar. The other thing about them, and here in Oregon, we're familiar with our uh, uh, elk and with our deer, and uh, they'll shed their antlers and they'll, they'll grow another set. Uh, you take one of these off of a ram or off of, uh, what's the animal? Uh, the kudu. The kudu. You take one of these off that animal, it, it does not grow back. Mm -hmm. So one, once you harvest these, it, it doesn't grow. Um, and those are just a couple interesting points when we think about this shofar. Now the sound of it is very distinctive. Um, and there's a lot of spiritual significance associated with the sound of this uh, uh, shofar in the scriptures. And we'll look at a few of those today. But um, first let's look at Exodus 19. And this is when the shofar or the trumpet was first mentioned as the children of Israel came out of Egypt. All right, and we're going to be looking at verses 16 through 19 in Exodus 19. So beginning with verse 16, it came to pass on the third day in the morning there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. This We're talking about Mount Sinai. And the sound of a trumpet was very loud. Now you think this was loud. 
the, the one they heard, I can't imagine how loud it was. But it was so loud, in verse 16, it says, all the people who were in the camp trembled. Now that sound of that shofar was God sounding the shofar. The, his shofar. I don't know how God made that sound. I don't know whether he had one of these and had angels blowing him. We're not told. But we're just told that he had already told Moses that when you hear this trumpet, all the people come together when you hear the shofar, which is what they did. But what happened was that when he brought them together, um, in verse 19, the blast of this shofar, or a shofar, sounded long and became louder and louder and louder. So it didn't stop blowing, and while it was blowing, it got louder and louder. I don't know how God did that, but the sound of it and the length of it, we're told, uh, scared everyone so badly that they ask Moses to not have God speak to them. God's word being spoken was associated with the sound of that shofar on the mountain. So it had spiritual significance. It was God's sound to those people. Now if we go back to verse 10, we'll find that it had another use that was associated with this time. In verse 10, the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their clothes. Let them be ready for the third day because on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in sight of all the people. We're told in the scripture that when he came down, it was as fire. That from down in the, the bottom of the mountain, as they looked up, they could see the evidence that God was there from the fire that was up there. They knew that he was there also because of the sound of the shofar that was long and loud. And he said uh, in verse 9, I am going to come to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak to you and believe you forever. Then the Lord said to the people in verse 10, Consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them be ready for the third day. You shall set bounds around for all the people saying, Take heed that you don't go up and touch the mountain or its base. Whoever touches it will be put to death. So God is saying... This is a sacred time. This is a sacred sound. This is a sound that called for a, an assembly of all of Israel to come and to listen to what God had to say. Um, so now, the, also, the, the shofar, if you turn to Joshua 6, uh, if we, it, I can just tell you what's, what's there. In Joshua 6, the first 20 verses is about a battle that Joshua had and this sound, this horn, called them to battle. So God not only used it, but Israel used it, uh, especially in battle, to call to battle. It was also used, as we learned last week, that it would be blown to end a battle. It would tell everybody that the battle was over also. So this sound is is an important sound. And the reason we're having these messages, as, as, uh, as you'll remember, was that uh, the Feast of Trumpets is coming up. We don't know what year Jesus will fulfill it, but we believe he will also fulfill the Feast of Trumpets, the sound of, of this. And we learned last week that it's blown uh, uh, at least a hundred times on the day of the Feast of Trumpets. Um, also, it's a custom that for the month before Tishri starts, every day of the month before this is blown. Every day. 
in preparation for the Feast of Trumpets. So it has a lot of, of uh, spiritual significance. Let's, um, let's look at um, some of the blasts and what they mean to, the, to Israel today. I've, I've listed three kinds of blasts, and I think Mike may have hit all of them there as he was blowing that. It's a specific uh, uh, type of blast, each one. So the first one I've listed for you is a long blast. Uh, the Jews see that as, as being a symbol of God's reign and power. So that first blast gives God the glory for who he is and the power that he has. Then there are three medium blasts that can be blown. These represent uh, the wailing of, of men's heart to connect to God. And this is, this is I, I got these from a Jewish teaching that I read through. Um, and then the final set is nine quick blasts. And uh, it's, it's considered to be like an alarm clock. Uh, it's a wake-up call to you. So on the Feast of Trumpets, when this is blown, there will be multiple series of these three blasts. Long ones, medium three, and nine very quick. And all of those have a spiritual significance to them. So this shofar and the sound of it and the spiritual significance is going to carry through all of these lessons about the trumpets that we're going through. We're going to see that it's there in each one of them as we see how it's uh, used in the scripture. Now, people know, are fairly familiar with this, with the shofar, but what some people are not familiar with is that God commanded Moses and Aaron to make two other trumpets. And um, I've given you some information about them. Uh, his command is in Numbers 10, and you can read that on your own, the first 10 verses. But it, God asked them, commanded them, to make two of these. And <clears throat> if you're following along in your notes, you'll see that they're constructed, they were constructed, of pure silver. They were hammered silver. In other words, they took enough silver that they could pound it out, uh, hammer it, until they had a sheet. Uh, these were considered to be about 27 inches long, and I've just estimated it there. It's pretty close. So these weren't huge trumpets. These were smaller silver trumpets. They took the hammered sheet, and they made the uh, mouthpiece and they made the main part uh, with this uh, fluted end uh, where the sound came out. This central part is called a nope. Um, it was kind of strange to me because I had never uh, learned about a nope. But it's, it's, a, it's a, like flax, it's like a cloth with beeswax and the purpose for it is that when you put these two together this would hold them tightly together and that way the mouthpiece could be separate and you could clean the mouthpiece and so forth. <clears throat> These stayed in the temple until 70 AD when the Roman general Titus came in, brought his armies with him, completely destroyed the temple. You remember Jesus prophesied not one stone would be left on top of each other, and it wasn't. Every single stone was taken apart in that temple. Hundreds of thousands of Israelites were killed by Titus, the, the Roman general. If you go to Rome today, there is an arch there, uh, and it's the Arch of Titus. And inside that arch, it's a huge arch, and inside of it is this relief carving. And in that relief, it shows Titus and his armies 
bringing everything that was in the temple back to Rome. Things like the showbread table. Things like these two trumpets. They're actually shown there. That's how we know it's about 27 inches. Because God gave specific commands about the length and breadth and height of the table of showbread that was in the temple. That table is shown on that relief. So you could take the measurements of that table and scale it, and you could take the trumpets that are shown with it, and you could figure out they were about 27 inches long. So these were not huge uh, trumpets as we know trumpets today. The thing they also lacked was there are no keys on them, obviously. And so the, the sounds from this were limited. But these silver trumpets were only blown by Aaron and by his sons, who were the priests. They weren't blown by anybody else. And I've listed for you under 2B the, the reasons that they would blow these two trumpets. For instance, if both of these trumpets were blown at the same time, the entire uh, uh, congregation of Israelites was expected to come there in the desert in front of the tabernacle to hear from Moses uh, whatever God had spoken. Um, so when both of them blew, everybody came together. When one of them was blown, only the leaders came together. And they met with Moses there in front of the tabernacle. So it was a way to call the congregation together, either all of them or just the leaders. We also know that it was a way to tell the people, it's time to move our camp. Now, this isn't like you and me going up here um, and camping up in uh, the Cascades. Uh, with a tent. We're talking about millions of people that have to move. All of their belongings, all of their animals, all of their structures, their tents, it all had to be picked up and moved. That was quite a chore. God asked them to make these and they had certain uh, sounds on these trumpets that when the people heard it, they knew that God was telling them, I want you to move camp. I want you to pick up everything you have and I want you to go where I tell you to go. And you may remember from the scriptures, the way that he showed them is he had a, a pillar of fire and he had a pillar, a cloud of smoke by a day. And w when that picked up and moved, everybody was supposed to move with it. So this, this not only was calling the leaders together, but this was also used to tell them, hey, God wants us to go somewhere else and, and move from where we are. The other thing that it would, uh, was used for was an alarm that was associated with going to war. So whenever the Israelites moved camp, they moved by tribes. And each of those tribes had their own army. And so, the, in order to call those armies into battle, these trumpets were used for that also. And then finally, they were used along with the shofar in some of the feasts that God asked them to keep. But the point is, they were only to be used by Aaron and his sons, the priests, not by anyone else. Now what application can we gather from the shofar and from these two. Uh, if, we, if we focus particularly on these, uh, I want to uh, look at 1 Peter 2, 5 through 9 for this last part of our message. So let's turn over there, 1 Peter 2, 5 through 9. I'm going to back up um, to verse 4. 1 Peter 2, verse 4. Coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are built up into a spiritual house 
Now listen to what Peter says here next. You are a holy priesthood. You are to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, as it's contained in the scripture, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he's precious. But to those who are disobedient, he is the stone which the builders rejected and became the chief cornerstone and the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble. They are disobedient to the word to which they are also appointed. Now verse 9. Listen to what he says again. You are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may, may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness to his marvelous light. So think about Aaron and his sons. These were their instruments that they used for the various purposes. They were only to be blown by the priests. You and I are royal priests in the kingdom of God, each one of us. And we are to offer sacrifices and praises in the name of Jesus as priests in the kingdom. So our ability to speak about God, to sing praises about God, are similar to what the priests had then and use these four. So, uh, and another thing I forgot to mention, silver in the Bible represents a redeemed uh, person, a redeemed uh, item. So it, it stands for redemption. And so we, in fact, being redeemed and being a royal priesthood, it's, it is fitting for us to be able to use ourselves in the same way today that they used these trumpets. And so we should be calling people to come to the Lord. We should be sharing the truth about God. Uh, we should be making noise, if you want to think of it that way, about Jesus Christ to people. So we are a holy nation. We are set apart. We are a living sacrifice and we proclaim his praises today. We in fact are the fulfillment of the silver trumpets that God had the Israelites uh, make and use in, the, in that time that we've looked at. Romans 12, one through two, we are told that we are living sacrifices. And so we have the uh, redemption through Jesus Christ that makes us symbolize silver, just like these trumpets. So that's the application for us out of this message today. And we should be excited that God has fulfilled all of these things in the past as we look at them. You will notice that they are foreshadowing things that are going to happen, things that will be fulfilled. And so we'll, we'll make these applications every week as we look at the trumpets. So think of yourself as a silver trumpet. <laughs> think of you, and, and here's a couple other points, and I, I won't uh, bear this out very long, but they had to, they had to actually take a hammer, and they, they had to, it's called, uh, um, if, you, if you're familiar with wrought iron, that, that's what that means. They, they're actually wrought, they're actually hammered, into some kind of form. That's exactly what we're, is going on with us in our lives. We are being conformed to Jesus Christ. We are being hammered, in, in, a, in a good sense, into the representation of Jesus. We have been redeemed, and we are actually more valuable than silver. So. Uh, God bless this message to your hearts this week, and uh, let's thank Him for this message. Father, these messages about your trumpets are preparing us for the Feast of Trumpets, 
We don't know if you're going to come back this year on the Feast of Trumpets. We're pretty sure it's going to be on the Feast of Trumpets because you fulfilled every other feast exactly to the day and even the hour. And so we believe that the Feast of Trumpets is really important and that's why you gave us these messages. Help us, Lord, to examine our hearts and examine ourselves as we think about these trumpets and the, the, the spiritual significance of them and the reason for their sounds and, and how they were used. And, and let us think of ourselves as a trumpet for the Lord. And, and we give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.